this early morning image of, of our laboratories. Uh, and um, uh, European Spallation Source is a neutron source. That's also a facility for researchers to come and do research on materials, life science, and so on. And the good thing is that um, an X-ray source like ours and a neutron source complement each other very well. So it's typically the same type of users that can get uh, complementary information um, at both facilities. So e ESS um, is not up and running yet, uh, but it will. Uh, and uh, but we have then been running here since 2016. And also an interesting thing here, if you uh, anything about X-ray sources, we are the first, what they call this first, a fourth generation light source. Um, so these facilities are called light sources or synchrotrons. Um, and the technology that were was, um, I should probably say invented, started, developed in in Sweden, um, led to us being um, making a huge technology leap. I will um, talk about it a bit more in my next slides. Um, that then uh, made um, started a whole generation shift um, in facilities like this. So there are about fifty facilities like this around the world, uh, and now people are following us to to upgrade their facilities. So uh, this is like a new uh, iPhone generation or something. When it comes a new um, new generation, then the other um, stuff starts to feel a little bit old, and then you have to to um, develop those as well. Um, and yeah, we produce a really high quality light, um, which means that it's a really intense light for research. Um, it's also coherent, as we say. That means it just has the property, the property of laser. So it's a very laser-like um, light. And what that means is just that that gives the opportunities for experiments that hasn't, or techniques also that wouldn't have been possible if we would have a lower quality light. Um, and we have, we can deliver light all the way from uh, in the UV uh, light range all the way up to what is called a hard X-ray. So it's uh, X-ray goes in a bit of a spectrum. So I would say more uh, energetic X-rays. Uh, and we can deliver over this big range with, without any gaps in, in, um, in light wavelength or energy. So that's quite unique, I think, for our facility to stretch over such a huge uh, wavelength span, which also, of course, opens up then uh, opportunities for, for more uh, experiments. Uh, so we have, we operate 16 uh, beam lines or experiment stations. Um, so it's, they're called beam lines because it's basically every experiment station operates with their own uh, X-ray beam. So um, that's, that's the name of beam lines. Um, and there are 16 uh, experiment stations beam lines now in our spring uh, 23 user call that starts now. And all these stations are specialized in different areas. It could be scattering diffractions, which are the techniques that refer to um, the structure of a material. So um, the stuff that typically can give mechanical properties, also electronic properties. So the, uh, the way the atoms sit in the material. Uh, also imaging, just making really high quality images of so processes in materials. Um, or, or life science, of course, um, and also spectroscopy, which refers to chemical content or chemical reactions on, on the surface of a catalyst, for example. Um, so um, users would typically apply for a beamline that um, has equipment that would um, suit their uh, specific needs. And uh, just an example of a such experiment station, a quite a new addition. This is our, there were two um, new experiment stations that came online now, uh, just uh, really a couple of months or even weeks ago. Uh, and um, this is the four max experiment station and four stands for forest. Um, and this particular experiment stations are looking into materials from renewable sources. 
So for example, from materials from the forest. Um, and their specialty is, is materials across length scales. So for example, the wood uh, is one of the things that they will then be looking at. And that has very structure on very many different length scales. So it has one atomic scale structure and it's got structure on micrometer level and it's got even up to macroscopic structure. And the way they are able to look at those different length scales is, is something that we call multimodal imaging, or they can combine techniques uh, in a way so that they can actually cover the whole um, range of, of sizes, which is uh, very uh, useful for this type of materials. And also the financing is a bit interesting because it, they're financed through a consortium of um, companies, foundations, um, academic institutions. So it's typically uh, some companies from the forestry industry, for example, um, that has then. Uh, so we have all the experiment stations have slightly different financing models. So some uh, there is also one that, for example, is financed partly by Nova Nordisk Foundation for life science, for example, and so on. And there is also experiment stations financed from other countries, so Denmark, uh, Finland, Estonia, um, and so on. So it's. Uh, uh, there are many ways to, to run such a beamline. And uh, then if we look at the facility from above, if we would take the roof off, then we would see something like this. Uh, so uh, what you see here is a big structure for uh, making light and then all these little um, beam line sticking out. I hope you can see my arrow here. Uh, the beam line sticking out here then refers to this beam lines or experiment stations that, that can use the light. So here you can see then that we have, uh, if we would count them, you would see that there is actually 16 here. And you can also see that it's an old picture because the Micromax here, the 16th one, uh, should actually be in um, commissioning, which is the first part of, of operation. So it's when experts come in and and uh, test the beamline together with the um, uh, beamline staff or the beamline crew. So uh, I'm just going to walk you through a little bit of how how do we um, make this intense uh, and um, high quality light for research that we do. So um, if we then look at those structures here, the red dot is, is where the picture is taken. So this is a very messy picture here of the first part of the facility. So this is uh, the electron source. Um, and we use electric currents basically to generate the x-rays that we need for research. Um, but at home, your current would flow in, in a copper wire, uh, whereas here the current flows through vacuum so that we can make the electrons in the current very fast. Um, and then we can affect the electrons with um, the magnetic fields to make them emit uh, X-ray light. So um, in here somewhere is, I think in here, is the metal plate that gets very hot, about 1000 degrees. And then um, is a cloud of electrons starts to form around the metal. And then an electro electric field can grab the electrons and, and form them into a beam that we can then accelerate so that we would have this very fast current of electrons moving through vacuum. And also I like this picture because it shows a little bit the different systems that we have. So I mean we have uh, cooling systems, uh, so this copper wire down here, we have control systems, we have safety systems, we have a lot of vacuum systems and you can see that there's a lot of different types of technology in here to make this work. Um, and then the um, electrons are um, formed into a beam by electric field and basically they, they move through a long tube where they meet. So this is a, just a long cylindrical tube where they meet different electromagnetic fields that will give them pushes forward uh, until they reach almost the speed of light. So they, this is a ex linear accelerator, so they get accelerated, the electrons. And um, then we inject them. So we open a little uh, hole basically into uh, the storage rings, which are just rings of also the cylindrical vacuum vessels. So it's just a um, ring formed uh, vacuum vessel basically. 
uh, where the electrons are circulating turn after turn uh, after because when they are injected they they have already reached their maximum speed so then they're injected and then there is nothing to really stop them because it's vacuum so they just keep going around and around in there and this is what a uh, part of such a storage ring looks like so here we have big magnets uh, the the yellow ones here um, that are surrounding this um, vacuum chamber where the electrons are traveling uh, and the magnetic fields they keep the electrons in place and they um, focus them and bend them um, so that the form will follow the ring shape so what you see here is also this is that we have two rings so we have the large ring and we have the small ring so the large is called r3 here is because the, its energy is three giga electron volts so it's just a technical thing here um, and um, the large ring is this uh, enormous leap of technology uh, that was made because in a usual storage ring like this, it has actually it has corners. So this one has 20 corners. And if we would just build conventionally, we would have two magnet blocks per corner and we would they would make the electrons make the turn in that corner so that they would then follow actually the ring shape. Uh, but we put instead seven magnets. Um, so here you see, I think one, two, three, four, five. So there are two more for this one, this turn. Um, and this makes the travel of the electrons smoother. So it just makes for a higher quality electron beam and then higher quality a light that we can generate from this X-ray beam. And um, this, um, um, is of course not uh, an easy thing. So this couldn't just be done. It had to have a lot of technological things to be able to work. So um, both um, these magnets um, had to be machined very um, carefully uh, to be able to fit all these, uh, to be able to actually fit seven uh, mag magnet blocks um, into each turn uh, like we have here without getting an enormous ring, which would be much ex too expensive to pursue. Um, and also um, the um, vacuum chamber, the, the vacuum chamber that the electrons travel in had to be made very small to fit into those more compact magnet structures, which is also quite a uh, challenge uh, because it's very difficult to pump vacuum in in a um, is in a narrow small vacuum chamber. Um, so there are a lot of of technological things that needed to be solved to be able to make such a, a magnet lattice, as we call it, the the structure, the sort of the setup of magnets that we have around the storage ring. And this is called the multi-band acromat. So it just means that an acromat is such a section where the beam bends, and um, the multi bend means that it has more bends than the conventional two. Then, so we have here seven. And there are also plans on upgrading this to more bends as technology gets better and, and um, we can, yeah, we are always looking to, to upgrade. So, um, this is a little bit of a relay race in the accelerator world that people, um, Somebody is, is best for a while, we have been, and now other people are starting to make their uh, sources better, and then maybe somebody else will be a little bit better for a while, and then we will take a look at their technology, and then we will make even better. So also it's a very open, so to say, competition, So because it's not really a competition like that. It's more we are all competing towards the same goal of making science better. So we have had uh, people from light sources all over the world to see are uh, op very open. I mean, everybody can find the, uh, can can uh, get the uh, drawings pretty much for this, um, this setup of magnets so that they can make their own or even better. Uh, but we're very proud to, to have uh, realized the first uh, of this fourth generation light sources here in Sweden. Um, there are also other magnets uh, around the ring. So this is again in the storage ring. So this is called an undulator and the vacuum vessel that the electron travels in. You can't see it here, but it goes through the middle of this huge, big blue cast iron and magnet structure. And here are a lot of permanent magnets in here that uh, affects the electrons so that they would actually make a little bit of a zigzag movement. 
And when electrons does that, they emit a very strong, uh, bright X-ray beam in the forward direction that we then can lead through a pipe out to the uh, experiment station. So we have those huge mag magnet structures that um, then we have one for each experiment station or, or beam line. Uh, and these weigh about 15 tons. I think they're very cool. Uh, they have to have this um, big cast iron shell because, of course, the forces between the magnets here is huge because there's very strong magnets. There are a couple of Teslas. Um, and to, and then, then they are a couple of millimeters from each other. So, I mean, it's a enormous forces on, on this structure here. Uh, so, I'm just going to also say something about the science that the users do here at MAX4. So, uh, we have then three uh, typical modes of science. So I uh, talked for before about scattering, which is typically just you, you send in an X-ray beam that hits the sample, and the uh, the beam gets scattered in different directions. So you typically get a pattern of, of beams in different directions that then you can then take a picture of on your detector screen, and then this picture says something about the structure of the material. Uh, and this you can use, for example, then to, as in this little illustration here, see, uh, look at the different uh, length scales of, of wood, as I talked about before. There's also a very interesting experiment where um, there was a company that looked at steel um, and how steel changes its um, internal structure or phase. Um, when it's under impact, so when it's pulled, for example, like in this uh, loading rig here, where they could pull the steel apart, uh, and they tested at different speeds, because this is important, because steel is protecting you, in a, for example, in a car impact, and then you want, then actually by the impact, the steel is changed, so it can either become stronger and protect you better, or it would maybe become brittle, or or in some way uh, non-optimal. So this is uh, interesting for the car industry to, to know uh, how steel would, uh, what would happen to steel when you when you affect it in different, when you pull in different speeds, basically. And as far as I understood from the users here, this is one of the first experiments where you can actually pull in a speed that was relevant for this um, question that they had, because this is one thing with the high quality light of Max 4 here that, uh, we can do more realistic experiments because now that we have higher intensity light, we can actually access the speeds and uh, um, conditions where where something uh, is more of a more realistic experiment. And we also have uh, this uh, a little uh, what's it called um, lobster, almost I think a shrimp um, that has very special claws, and and that's also something that they have researched because it's an interesting material that maybe can be used for something. Um, spectroscopy then, as I said, refers to chemistry. Um, so you shoot x-rays at a surface. Uh, it uh, knocks out what's called photoelectrons. It's just particles coming from the sample. And the particles will have a certain energy. And you can measure the energy of the particles, uh, get a spectrum. And out of this, you can then uh, know something about very detailed about the chemistry of the surface, typically, of a sample. So you can look at catalysis here, gases coming in and, and uh, catalyze on a particle surface here, for example, or look at uh, the chemistry of, of uh, recycled um, where um, when you burn uh, your um, garbage, when then uh, that ash can actually be recycled and used for different things. If you know the chemistry, to look at corrosion, corrosion protection, and also materials, for example, batteries or energy storage. Um, and also imaging. Um, there was a company also steel again here where they looked at um, inclusions. So those little. So I guess I would say unwanted or at least spontaneous um, little things that, that will sit inside your steel that you didn't really mean for to be there, and then how that affects the, uh, the strength of your steel uh, to make this ultra high strength steel, because then if you can have ultra strength, then you can make it thinner and make lighter transports, for example, which would be uh, interesting from an environmental point of view. And also nanomaterials, for example, here it's it's uh, viewed in very much detail how the structure along such a um, nanomaterial um, changes along its length here, and you can follow it and heat it up and so on. Um, and then this is this is my last slide here. So I um, 
have uh, if the, somebody would would be interested in actually having access to Max4 uh, as in being a user. So there are two different uh, modes of access. There is um, standard access mode, which is the one that typically academic researchers would use. It's free of charge and the group applies in uh, this um, user call. Uh, and we have, uh, I think we have about five times as many um, applications as we have um, possible shifts uh, to give and, um, and then a program advisory committee with external researchers will look through, through the applications and uh, um, will then grade them and then the ones that gets the highest score will then get their beam time as it's called time at the beam. Um, also uh, proprietary access is access that can be uh, bought by industries. So this is something that doesn't go in the uh, normal uh, user access or user call, but um, uh, instead is something where the um, user contacts the ind ind our industry office and then they can sign an agreement. Um, and typically a, somebody that has proprietary access will not have to publish their results and they, they own their results uh, in a different way than people that go, come through standard access have to publish in a, in a scientific publication because otherwise next time they won't be as welcome because this is sort of our, what we live on is, is um, uh, scientific publications. So uh, yeah, that was my presentation and I think I have a few minutes for questions maybe. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, I don't know if we have uh, time for questions. It's uh, okay. it's two thirty Swedish time, oh, and uh, we. I have... was just looking at my timer. Sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> we since we we had a few minutes in the beginning where we did introductions, so I think that's fine. Uh, if you have, this is of course a very high level scientific research facility, so the immediate, unless you're a researcher, of course, it's going to be quite difficult to perhaps process all of this, a lot of high level words uh, to, to take in. Uh, but Emily and her presentation will be available to uh, for, for questions uh, at a later date, or you can go through me or or Emma or Ingela and we, we can put you in contact with Emily afterwards. Uh, of course, if you do the physical visit, uh, hopefully we can visit Max4 and ESS and we can get uh, more information on exactly how uh, uh, ESS and Max4 are useful for, for instance, your particular company and so forth. Um, with that said, uh, I would like to thank Emily again and hand over to uh, Zenny if she is here in the in the room. I can't see all the names. There she is. Uh, yes, I'm here. Yes, uh, welcome. And then I would like, without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over to uh, Zenny Liang from Skåne Startups. Uh, she is the manager uh, of, for the for the Skåne Startups uh, ecosystem organization, and she will tell you a little bit about her organization and what's going on in that space in Skåne as well. The floor is yours, Annie. Super. Uh, I'm sharing a presentation right now. Uh, can you actually see it? Yes. Perfect. Uh, all right. So super excited to be here. My name is Jenny. I'm the CEO of Skåne Startups. Thank you for having me here. And the uh, Skåne Startup is a grassroots organization it started actually back in 2015 by a few local entrepreneurs, uh, Hampus Jakobsen and Jo Larsen. So, so Hampus Jakobsen is a local entrepreneur and he sold his business to uh, BlackBerry almost a decade ago and he wanted to do something to give it back to the entrepreneurial society. And Jo Larsen, he was running Fast Track Mama, one of the leading uh, incubators uh, in southern Sweden. Uh, and they came together and with a few bunch of others entrepreneurs and said, how can we, uh, you know, like inspire more people to start a business? So they started by inviting their own friends to share experiences on, on building a successful business. So th the funny story I heard is that at the very beginning, they would, eat, they would buy beer for anybody to show up to the event uh, to get people to come. Um, but then eventually things grow. 
uh, and then it's going to start has been organizing one of the largest uh, startup conference called the Startup Live here in southern Sweden. And I'm sorry, I jump right into the presentation. I just want to say, if you have any questions, feel free uh, feel free to raise your hands or uh, send your question on the chat here. Uh, I don't know how uh, I don't know if the audience is working with the uh, startup community uh, communication, um, but it, but this is uh, what the main presentation will be about. So feel free to ask any questions. Uh, so here you can see some picture from Startup Alive. We gather like a thousand plus students, entrepreneurs, investors uh, in Southern Sweden. And the, the mission of the, uh, the, the organization is to really make sure that the, uh, sorry, let me just, is it, uh, I have some, can you guys see the screen, right? Yes. Perfect. Is it F5 to full, full screen, is it? There should but, be a presentation mode, but I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> if, okay, you, if, and, you, if you press the little arrow thing next to the blue button that says convert, you'll get at least a, a broader uh, next to that one. Yes. Uh, not. Uh, okay. It, no, it doesn't work. But okay, as long as you guys can see, it's fine. Right? Cool. So, uh, so right now we have like a, a more than 5,000 different community members and we organize 40 different events per year. And right now in our startup database, we have a, a roughly um, a 600 startups in the database. But this database, we are constantly updating it. And so just a bit of background of the board member in the organization. We are very small organizations, but we have a very strong board who are all uh, entrepreneurs, investors in the region who are very passionate about supporting entrepreneurs. Paulotta um, Fabi, she used to be the uh, uh, board member of Access Communication, and Paulotta Tong Stark, she used uh, she's the CEO of Ming Doctor. Uh, sorry, used to be the CEO of Ming Doctor. Now she's starting her own digital health tech startups here in Malmö and the Hampus Jakobsen and Jo Larsen right now, they are the uh, general partner of uh, Pale Blue Dot, which is a VC fund here uh, based in Malmö, investing early stage climate tech uh, startups. And Karsten, who is the uh, co-founder of Mind Park, is a cluster of uh, uh, co-working spaces uh, space here in Skwangne. Uh, hopefully you will be able to visit some of the uh, business here. And exactly what we do. Um, so. So the core mission number one is supporting entrepreneurs. So we as organization, we're always on the outlook, scouting for uh, early stage and hopefully it's early stage entrepreneurs um, who are building international business. So it's very important for us that we don't support, we don't support a consultancy business, but rather a, a software business, um, a startup founders who has ambition to go global. Uh, and why, and we connect them to the international investors. So why is this extremely important? Because there's a lack of uh, access to risk capital in this region in comparison uh, to some other places. If you see the uh, European tech report, I think in 2020, I think most of the venture capital funding goes to Stockholm, which is the, uh, the I mean, the capital, and much less venture capital funding goes to uh, regions in southern Sweden, uh, Malmö, Lund, and Helsingborg. And then there's a, a and there's a lack of international connections specifically uh, to, to, to US uh, and some of the other market. And that is why I, I think organizations like Invest in Squangne and Squangne Startup exist to, to build that bridge for entrepreneurs. And so so we do how so a, we do this by organizing lots of different investor chat and the founder pitch. So this is just some of the uh, example of investor we have been working with. Um, and we have invited like Japanese investor, Telia Venture, which is a corporate VC. Uh, and then a uh, term PLC is a, a IOT investor in UK. And the Partech partner is quite large, a private equity VC uh, based in Paris and the worldwide to meet the local uh, Squang Net based entrepreneurs. So to give them a bit of overview of uh, if you want to uh, raise venture capital and build a global business, uh, what kind of criteria uh, you should be able to, to reach. So, so far, is there any questions? Um, no? Okay, super. I, th uh, I think we'll take the question in the end if we have time, Zenny. So okay. if, that's, if that works. Yes, now we'll continue. 
and here just uh, here I want to give you some stories or idea or put some faces uh, for you guys to see some of the entrepreneur, amazing entrepreneurs from our region. So for example, Position Green is a, a software business to help people to uh, help business to deal with the ESG compliance and the sustainability report. And the World Diagnostic, which is called Able Mind, which was, uh, which was awarded as the best startups in Malmö uh, in 2022, uh, they are diagnosing uh, uh, people's psychological mental health by the way they speak. And the Ecolution is a, a hardware uh, insulation business uh, based in uh, Malmö. And Meja Health is a business that is uh, uh, building, uh, based, based in Squan as well, but building a digital health platform uh, for, for, for Africa. And so here, and the MedBeat is a hardware device to, to track your like heartbeat uh, and the company sees at Mink. Um, so you can see there's a diverse of entrepreneurs here in the region uh, from software, hardware, um, a, from digital health um, to like um, a, 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 a different software business. A, here just more example from um, uh, some of the events we did with these entrepreneurs and how we connected uh, to different uh, investors through the events. And then uh, the, the, the events we do for entrepreneurs is what we you see often in the surface. But what we actually do behind the scene is lots of investor service. So we have a huge network of, a huge network of investors and we uh, do business development type type of work and we reach out to those investors, understand what kind of uh, startups they're looking for into the region. And somehow uh, we, we try to show them data and try to convince them that, hey, if you're looking to invest in the Nordics and if Sweden is your target market, don't just look over to Stockholm. There's so many happening here in Malmö, Lund and Helsingborg in this part of the uh, in this part of Sweden. And so this is some examples um, a, some quite successful exit from uh, startups uh, in the region. For example, uh, Motcam, which is acquired by Cisco Ventures, Mapillary, which was acquired by Facebook and joined the Academy, which raised like $23 million uh, back a few, a few years ago. And I think uh, Wai Skuang, I think uh, Emily, the, the previous presenter, I, I think she has uh, uh, done a very good presentation regarding that because there was a cutting edge technology here in the region and there are lots of uh, smart people here doing really cool stuff and our job is to uh, make people to be aware of what is happening here uh, to to educate them that if they are looking into investment opportunities uh, here here are some of the companies they should be speaking to and so these are some of the investors uh, we work with and then um, and we also so what you see that's the key part of what we do and the second part of what we do is lots of community service because everything I've been speaking so far is about the startups and the founders. But, they, but it's very important to nurture an environment where the founders can meet other founders and the founders can easily get access to advice, mentorship, you know, uh, or advisor, whatever service they might need. So we organize lots of founder meetup. And the reason why we do, do that is that extremely important to build a super connected uh, a startup ecosystem. So the more connected the founder is to other founder, to other investor, to advisor, they're just more you know, uh, easier to get access to help. And uh, this is uh, data from the uh, startup genome and they have done research that the startup ecosystem such as uh, uh, Helsinki and Stockholm, uh, the more connected the ecosystem is, the more, more likely entrepreneurs in that region to build a more successful business. Um, so this is uh, some of the founder Figa Friday uh, we have been organized uh, with the, the co-founder of Get Accept uh, and the, uh, the previous co-founder of In River, and now he started his own business called Octu. And the, on top of all of this, uh, there's one very important mission to our organization is a woman in entrepreneurship. And in the start of a database with uh, right now, I think roughly 500 companies who have been updated in this May, there are not enough female founders. And we want to encourage more female founders to start a business and hopefully help them to grow. 
So we have been organizing the Women Young Entrepreneurship Initiative. And during the pandemic, we have been organizing weekly meetup. Um, a, a, a pretty much every single week, we would, decide, we would decide some sort of workshop topic and we would invite uh, eight to 10 female uh, entrepreneurs or those who are interested in entrepreneurs to gather together and share experiences. Uh, this is just uh, some of the uh, uh, workshop we have done. And the reason why we think this is very important, why we do that is that we want to close uh, the funding gap. And this data is a little bit out, outdated. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't think this has been changed dramatically yet. I think there's still a clearly a lack of funding to the female founders or founders from different genders. So this is something we would like to change by organizing uh, this workshop and the, uh, this initiatives. Um, yeah, um, so this is uh, pretty much coming to the end of my presentation. I have another 20 page, but that's uh, about the theory of a startup community. I don't want to bore the audience uh, on that, but this is pretty much what we do. Um, so you, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer those questions now. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, yes, if there are questions, uh, we we have time for those. Um, and we uh, some some things to mention perhaps is that you your organization is not limited to to any particular cluster or anything like that. You mentioned uh, several of them in your in your presentation, but Mink is of course one of the uh, cluster organizations or or incubators that you work with. But you also have several other companies that are not in in the Malmo based uh, incubators, but also in the other areas. For instance, Helsingborg, Kasten Dappert is uh, part of the board. For instance, uh, could you elaborate a little bit about the on the, on that? aspect that you try to encompass the entire region uh, because that is perhaps not something that other presenters in in the for their own incubator would mention in that sense yeah so for squander startup thank you for the question that's a very good question uh, for squander startups for us it's very important to serve entrepreneurs so it doesn't really matter to us which incubators or accelerators they are associated with which city they are based if they are in uh, Mama Lund, Helsingborg. Um, and for us, it's very important as long as they're entrepreneur based in this region and they are interested in raising venture capital. And this is the this is the part we are specialized in. And then we're here to help. So so in this in this sense, we don't have any focus regarding location, um, but we do have a focus that the business needs to be um, BVC venture capital fundable. Thank you. And um, and you're also technology agnostic, is that right? Yes, exactly. Um, it, but mostly, um, since we are also serving investors, and most of the investors we're working with right now, they're more interested in SaaS, like software mm. business. Um, uh, there's very few investors inter interested in hardware, but we haven't seen so many. Mm. Hey, Emma, you have a question here. I do. Thank you. And um, that was a really good presentation, Zenny. Thank you for that. I suppose for, from our perspective, what I'm trying to understand is the international aspect. So you've spoken a lot about, you know, the, the, the local ecosystems and things. But do you guys work with international companies? Like, how does that work? It, is there specific things that you look for in, in that relationship? Or I, I think due to the uh, due to the, uh, due to the structure of the organization and the how we receive our fundings. Uh, we limit our work only on supporting business that is based on in Skwangne. For example, uh, we, uh, so for example, our sponsors, including the local banks and local law firms. And the reason why they are part of our sponsors because they want to see the local business grow. And eventually if they would be going IPO or being acquired, they would go to the law firms. Uh, so, so, so we are nonprofit, but then we are not, owned by the government. Uh, most of our sponsors are private. And then we also receive a funding from region Skwangne, which is heavily focused on Skwangne region. So we don't do much work to support international business to establish uh, here, but rather we support the local startups uh, if they're going abroad and building a global business. And then we are here to offer uh, connections and open doors for them. I hope that answered uh, your question. 
It does. Thank you. One one addition to that is also that, of course, uh, which I was I was going to ask as well, is, but if there is a company that is interested in the ecosystem and that is increasingly uh, of interest, both for investors but also for the for startups from other places that perhaps either or uh, international people who move to Skåne and they want to establish a business because if uh, the Skåne startups and Skåne in general is quite diverse in terms of nationality and, and so forth. So a lot of the, I mean, it's a very international context that Skåne startups, the Skåne startup work in. Olaf, do you mean like if we support uh, international people to start a business here or? Oh, no, I'm just saying that uh, the companies that you work with are quite a diver diverse group and there's a lot of nationalities. I mean, I think uh, last time I, I saw your staff, uh, for instance, there was there was no Swedish people in the staff. It's only international students or international people living in Malmö, for instance, and, and so forth. So it's just that uh, there is, even though we don't support, for instance, foreign companies to come into Sweden uh, or companies that are looking for, for partners and so forth, uh, there is a very welcoming uh, atmosphere and people are coming from the same sort of place being outside of Sweden. But if they're looking to establish or find potential partners and connect with, with Skåne startups and the companies in that ecosystem, they can go through Invest in Skåne because that's more of our role than, than Skåne startups. Exactly. And and I want to add on that. I'm super excited that you guys will be visiting Malmö. And I can tell you that Malmö is one of the most unique places in the Nordics. Because when Wolof is talking about this international uh, talents we're working with, this is just naturally how the city is. Because there's so many international talents here. I think Malmö has, uh, a, the last time I heard, is 180 different nationalities living here. Mm. And that is just unique strength of the city, of the region, because you have so many different people from different, like having different background, you know, come, coming together, uh, starting business. And that's just, for me, it's uh, magical. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, 180 different nationalities. And then it's actually one of the youngest cities uh, as well. Uh, most, uh, and also uh, most inter uh, diverse in the, in the sense that, um actually 51 percent of the city is foreign born so it is actually more international than than swedish which is quite interesting so so yeah any other questions from the audience yeah if the audience doesn't have a question but i have a question for some for the audience <laughs> <laughs> i'm just curious like a uh, I, I heard from Olaf that you 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 will be visiting some of you uh, in Malmö. Uh, is there any specific companies you you would be interested in in meeting with? Uh, anything we can uh, do more to help out here, um, so that you can get an overview uh, of what is happening, especially in the startup ecosystem uh, here in southern Sweden. Or a particular industry perhaps is easier rather than a particular company. So I think to be fair, um, obviously we're, we're working on the, the programme. So we've got, you know, you guys have all come on and kindly given us an overview. And I know we've got another couple after you, Zeni, um, uh, come on to kind of talk about the different industries and the different ecosystems and the different sectors that you guys have. Um, the majority of people on the call will will fall into those categories. Um, but I think it's been really interesting actually to hear some of the other um, speakers talk about. So for example, Max Ford, it took me a bit to kind of get my head around, you know, what they do and, and, and how, how we can support and actually how they can support us as well. And um, so, yeah, I think it's, it, it's probably a difficult question to answer, I would say, in that, you know, the, the purpose of these calls is to kind of let people understand what Sweden has available, Skuna obviously in particular, um, and, and hopefully we can make some connections and some matches in that way. Teddy, did you have your hand up? Have you changed your mind? Or? Yes and no. Uh, thank you. You actually answered that really well, Emma. Thank you very much, um, Jenny. That was a that was a 
very engaging presentation. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to visit the region. And um, predominantly from my perspective, um, food businesses or health food type thing, that, that is most definitely manufacturing. That, that's most definitely, I'm not quite sure what the crossover would be for you there. But as Emma was saying, it's the whole banquet of different things to offer and really to gain an understanding of what the opportunity is for us to participate constructively and to, to, to give as well as to, to receive from that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to add on that. When you were talking about the food, I think it would be super interesting to be connected to Queen Huangsta uh, because there is okay. a food science incubator in Queen Huangsta. And also mm -hmm. in, Malma, uh, in Malma City, there's some, there are quite many food tech startups as well. Excellent. Thank you. I think that we'll have to serve for the final word from Skona Startups and, and Zenny. And uh, I think we can move on to Petra Hartmann, the CEO of Medicon Village. Uh, who is the next presenter, who has been with us from the beginning. So uh, nice to see you, Petter. Thank you, guys. I'll, thank you, Zenny. I'll hand over to Petter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Olof. I hope you all can hear me and uh, good afternoon. Uh, what a pleasure to join this uh, webinar and thank you for having me. Um, as Olof said, my name is Petter Hartmann and uh, let me see if I can share my screen while introducing myself very briefly. Um, I am the CEO of a science park in uh, one of the cities here in Skåne called Lund, a very much a university uh, city. Um, and uh, I came here uh, in November last year, so I'm fairly new at my job here still. I don't know how long I can play this uh, new at uh, my job uh, card, but uh, it's still it's uh, it's really excited to be here. Uh, I came uh, back to Lund after 12 years in Copenhagen. Uh, and this science park that I represent is the largest science park in the Nordics concentrated on life science. And uh, to you, Terry, who asked for food uh, related, food tech related uh, uh, questions, etc., I think uh, the life science sector that I will spend my minutes on talking about and present, present about will, of course, also touch upon uh, the, the food sector and, and the connections there, and we can come back to that perhaps. Also, of course, the relations to the tech sector. Uh, it's a lot of things going on in the life science industry and in the life science sector. And I would like to start by giving or setting the frame a little bit about uh, where we uh, where we are at in, in this ecosystem. And uh, I've started to zoom out a little bit because uh, for those of you who heard from the first presentation about Max4 and, and Emma, I agree with you. It's really uh, complicated and difficult also for us living in Lund, uh, meeting the folks at Max4 on a weekly basis. Um, she mentioned uh, in her presentation that uh, Novo Nordisk, a Danish company and a Danish foundation has invested into uh, Max4. And this is what my first slide actually illustrates that Lund is a quite tiny, not a tiny, but a quite small city, especially if we compare with all the different life science ecosystem around the world. Uh, we need to position our position ourselves in, in a way so we can understand in what context we're in. And uh, here in our part of Scandinavia, when we talk life science, we uh, talk about Medicon Valley as the life science cluster here in, uh, in our part of Scandinavia. And that includes not only Sweden, this southern part of Sweden called Skåne, it also includes the eastern part of Denmark. So uh, we have the capital region of Denmark on the other side of the water, connect with the bridge, and then we have Skåne, Lund, Malmö and Helsingborg. And uh, when we do that, we not only create a critical mass that makes it easier for us to present ourselves globally for uh, international collaborators like you, uh, it's also a way for us to, to build on the historical ties that we have in this region that makes uh, the life science ecosystem much stronger. And, and once again, the, the investment from Danish foundations into Swedish uh, infrastructure, like Max4 is one very concrete example, but it could also be like people like me living in Sweden, working in the Danish life science uh, industry for uh, many years and then come back again uh, companies that are uh, moving back and forth and, and research collaborations. So uh, if you if you're interested in the life science sector and to to be part of this uh, ecosystem here, you get actually two countries for the price of one. 
<laughs> and you can also, I mean, get use use the the contacts we have because many of us working in Lund and Malmö also have really good contacts on the Danish side, which is which is really good. So uh, we have a very strong life science uh, ecosystem in in the broader sense in this region. But zooming into Skåne, uh, of course, we are the little brother compared to uh, the capital area of Denmark. But still, life science has a really strong heritage and long long history in in uh, in Skåne. We have some seven thousand five hundred people working in the private life science industry, and then, of course, a lot of people working in in the university hospital. I think it's about 12,000 people approximately. Um, we have some 400 companies on the Swedish side of the sound uh, working mainly. The, the, the strongest subsector is actually medtech, but we have a lot of uh, exciting uh, startups uh, within. Uh, yeah, the, the I guess we could say the combination of of tech, e-health, that kind of uh, segment as, as well, food, uh, nutrition related uh, prevention. And then uh, it's a lot of biotech companies as well. Uh, and as you can see on this slide, uh, the development for the, the life science sector in Skåne has been very positive over the last, let's say, seven, five, seven, six, seven years, something like that. We have increased the number of companies with about 100 new companies. We have seen a rapid growth in terms of employment. And we also see much more investments now compared to for, let's say, 10 years ago, which means that Someone is doing a really good job here, promoting the region, but also helping the companies that most often actually comes out of the university. And Lund University is a really important part of this ecosystem. If, if you ask me what I believe is the most important part or building block in this ecosystem, I would say it starts with the university research. Because with strong university research, you will attract strong researchers, you have a talent pool to recruit from. You have new ideas being generated at the university that could be spin out uh, in uh, to the incubators and the tech transfer offices could help them to develop their companies. And then you get these rings on the water that that uh, we have seen happen over the last uh, seven, six, six, seven years here. We have many different areas where, where I would say Lund University has a really strong position also globally. It's, it's mainly within uh, diabetes, it's within uh, neuroscience, it's within um, cancer very much. So we have a few areas. I mean, uh, everyone claims to be world leading, right? But in this case, we have some, uh, some really strong research centers connected to Lund University that, that makes a big difference. And that could also be you know, when you look at the type of companies we have, we can see that there is a strong correlation between the science taking place at the university and the type of companies we see at the science parks, for instance. So we, as a science park, live very close next door to uh, Lund University. We are not the only science park. Uh, I would say that Sweden is standing out in a way in when we compare ourselves to many other countries in Europe that we invest a lot of public money but also private money into the support system and uh, we believe very strongly that the science parks and the incubators and, and organizations like the Zenis that we just heard about makes a big difference for those who are interested in you know going from being a researcher at the university to actually start a company or a student at the university starting a company and uh, we have four incubator sorry uh, science parks in in this part of sweden that is uh, predominantly focused on or uh, main have a strong focus on life science so it's trinova up in in Trifansta, a really hard name to pronounce uh, this is what uh, seni mentioned when it comes to food especially they're very much trinova focused on food uh, we have Medicon Village that I represent, a science park in Lund. We have Ideon just next door to us, which is more tech focused, but still have some hundred life science uh, related companies in their facilities. And then we have uh, Medeon, which is a science park in, in Malmö uh, that is fully focused on, on life science. And I think this is one of the explanations that we invest so much in the support system and create environments where the companies can actually grow together with incubators, together with business angels, together with tech transfer offices and all the, the support you need. This is one explanation one why when, when the EU Commission every year present their uh, ranking of, of innovative countries in, in uh, the EU, for instance, it, Sweden and also the other Nordic countries tend to 
end up in the top five uh, category because we have a lot of resources going in that direction and so far it has worked pretty well. Uh, it's about private public uh, collaborations in different forms, I would argue. So I would I will then after setting the scene a little bit, I will dive into Medicon Village as a science park and why we are, uh, I would argue, a good start uh, if you're interested in the life science sector uh, when it comes to international collaboration and if you would like a stepping stone into the Nordic market. Um, we have been here for 10 years now, so we are quite young. Science Park, uh, our neighbor Ideon just across the street was uh, has more, almost 40 years uh, of experience to build on. But the history is actually quite special with Medicom Village because everything started back in 2011 with a big crisis. And, uh, you know, it's it's um, sometimes a crisis could be a really good thing, even though it's hard at the time. Uh, this site where I'm at was the former AstraZeneca site in Lund and at that time AstraZeneca had some 900 people around yeah around 1000 people working here in Lund and was a really important part of, of the life science ecosystem here in southern Sweden. Then in 2011 they decided to leave and uh, that was of course uh, a big crisis and a, a really hard blow for, for uh, uh, the business environment in, uh, in Skåne and especially for the life science sector. Um, but then some uh, really good forces, uh, people from academia, from the regions, from the municipality, and also some industry families joined forces and decided to do something about the situation. So uh, the owner of the largest construction firm in Sweden, Pia, uh, the, the owner, Mats Paulsson, he decided to actually start uh, or build a foundation. And uh, after um, the same very date when uh, AstraZeneca left, that, that foundation bought the site from AstraZeneca and took over the keys. And we said, let's make this a place where a lot of different uh, companies and researchers and clinicians from the hospitals can do something, start a new chapter of the innovation district in Lund. Uh, it was a empty, almost empty spaces. Uh, luckily, AstraZeneca left some instruments uh, and also some people, of course, decided to stay and not follow uh, AstraZeneca to, to Gothenburg and, and other places. They decided to start up new companies instead. And they became the first tenants of, of this science park. And uh, we yeah started slowly and uh, started to build um, together with the university. And while the university moved in, people and institutions uh, in these facilities and new companies moved in, we started to grow actually quite rapidly. And after five years, uh, we had more people sit, uh, working here at the site than when AstraZeneca actually peaked. Uh, 1,600 employees uh, here in uh, of the five years and, and some 120 organizations, member organizations. So all of a sudden people started to feel like, yes, it was a crisis, but this is actually working, this concept and the way we work uh, with the companies is actually also working because the companies uh, continued to grow. And then uh, over the last uh, couple of years, we have added new elements to our model. We have continued to build new buildings and, and also um, add new, uh, you know, um, different, uh, uh, our incubator, for instance, that does a fantastic job helping startups. And now we are celebrating our 10 years anniversary with uh, some uh, 180 companies uh, here at the site and more than 2,700 people working here on a daily basis. So. So it, it, it has been a, a fantastic journey, actually. One of the really special thing with Medicom Village as a science park is that it's it's owned by this foundation. And the idea with this foundation is that all the surplus that we generate from our tenants must go into the foundation and then the surplus should be reinvested into academic research. And this is this is. Uh, quite unusual actually in Sweden. I don't know if there is any other uh, science parks in Sweden that has this model. Normally it's a, a real estate company owning the science park and then it's of course for profit, which is absolutely fine. But but in this case, we can actually make sure that the the, the science park contributes to great science at the, at the universities and hopefully that will also contribute to that new uh, life science companies can be started up and, and uh, get the help from 
uh, university's um, tech transfer office that is also in place here at Medicon Village and then later on in the incubator and then grow in the science park. So it's it's a kind of circle circular way of, of looking at the, the life science ecosystem here, which I th think is really nice. In the beginning, we couldn't uh, donate so much money because it was a lot of costs connected with starting up this uh, facility. But since I think it's 2008, we have been able to slowly starting to grant money to, to academic groups in, in Malmö and Lund. And so far, we have been able to grant some 6.3 million euros. And uh, we, of course, expect that uh, amount to increase rapidly over the coming years. We have everything in place. I won't uh, spend much time to, to talk about uh, the things we can offer. That's pretty much uh, aligned with what uh, I guess uh, most science parks would, would offer. But uh, of course, we are eager to continue to expand. And, and I think we have high standards uh, in, in the things, in the way we work, but also in the facilities we provide. Um, this is what the area looks today. And I don't know if you can see the, the cruiser when I, when I move it over the screen. Uh, but this is a picture illustrating uh, our uh, area. And um, as you can see, there are still left some, some room for uh, uh, expansion. Uh, this is uh, really, it's, it's hard for you to see from, from where you're at now. But when you come to, to Lund, it will be easier to get an understanding of how we're, where we are placed in the, in the innovation district in Lund. Because uh, the MAX4 laboratory that we heard about in the beginning, is uh, a little bit away, like a kilometer away from where we are right now, just like the European Spallation Source. We have the idea of Science Park that is more tech oriented just across the street. And then we have the University Hospital and Lund University just a few hundred meters away from here. So it's very dense innovation community in, in Lund, which is uh, really interesting to work with, I would say. But then, of course, we would like to expand and continue our uh, journey. And uh, this is a visionary, very visionary picture uh, of how we would like it to, uh, to be in, um, in the coming years. Uh, it's nothing that you can do overnight, of course, but uh, if everything uh, goes like, like we hope and we continue to have good collaborators and high interest in, in, uh, in the investment uh, uh, ecosystem, etc., I'm I think we have a really good chance to achieve a lot of good things in, in this area as well. So uh, we have high expectations for the future, for the coming 10 years uh, for, at Medicon Village. So um, as I said, 180 organizations, uh, companies, I should say. And then uh, in addition to that, it's a lot of uh, academic institutions, some uh, healthcare related activities as well. Uh, we believe strongly in you know, people meeting each other, collaborating. We have a lot of different tools to support that via networks and, and of course, conferences and all this kind of stuff that goes without saying. We have a fantastic incubator that does a great job, Smile Incubator. So please have a look at that, uh, or we will make sure that you will be introduced to that when you come and visit us in September. Um, and um, yeah, I think we have pretty much uh, what is needed for the companies to, to develop. Very quickly, uh, a short look at the companies per indication. It's a lot of cancer related uh, research here uh, that goes very well hand in hand with uh, the uh, scientific focus uh, at the university and the fact that the university has placed a lot of cancer researchers at the site. Uh, but then, as I said, uh, diabetes, uh, infection, inflammation is also a major part. And, and I would also say that stem cells is something that is uh, coming. If we look at the incubator, as I said, Terry, we have uh, some of the companies working with in the cross field of, of life science and nutrition. We see a lot of uh, companies working with apps and technologies. So, so, I mean, life science as a sector, I guess, is a moving target, if, if I can uh, put it that way. Uh, the ecosystem we have, when we look at the companies, it's, it's mostly small companies, right? Uh, but, uh, and, and for me, uh, being responsible for the ecosystem here. I, I think it's super important for us that we don't just take the first asking or knocking on the door and say, can we move in? We have to look at how can we make sure that the ecosystem is working and that we have all the puzzle pieces so we can actually stimulate business to business between our members. Um, it's a lot of small companies, but we do also have some of the bigger players like Pfizer, uh, like BMS, for instance. So, so I would say it's a good mix. I would like to see more of the big international companies coming here as well. 
And if it's something that I that I think is, you know, every member here have in common more or less is uh, that they need to increase their internationalization effort. They need to get contact with other strong clusters around the world, other um, also in terms of uh, raising capital, etc. So I mean, giving being given this chance to to introduce to you guys is is uh, perfectly in line with with uh, what I should what I should do more or less, and and how we would like to to see a collaboration being formed. I mean, discuss the different needs and and then find if there are any ways we can collaborate around uh, you know business to business or in other. Uh, also facilitate contacts with university researchers, etc. That's that's uh, we're always open to discuss that. Um, and then finally, this is my my final slide. I think uh, this is a very generic uh, slide, but of course, I think also the sustainability issue is is becoming more and more important, and it's impossible to discuss any business sector without also addressing the need for new solutions and new new ways of, of adapting with the challenges we are facing with the SDGs. Um, at Medicon Village, we do a lot actually. We have tried to look at the, the site as a, a sort of test bed, not only when it comes to the different companies here, but actually also in construction wise. I mean, to make sure that we can use it to try out new solutions for energy, for instance, water cleaning, uh, when we build uh, new buildings here, can we try out new innovative ways of, of uh, how we, uh, yeah, the light system here, for instance, uh, is is uh, is a very special and, and delicate uh, system that we have developed to, yeah, to try to make the, the environment better in, in different ways. So uh, for us, of course, this is also interesting to share experiences with you guys, so you, how you work to, to um, develop your businesses uh, in a more sustainable way. And, and if we could do that together, that'd be great. I think that was my pitch. Uh, if there are any questions or any um, yeah, comments, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, Olof, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Um... Uh, I, I mean, I am from Lund, and I've been growing up next to to Medicon Village for, uh, since the beginning, basically. And every time, I'm I'm fascinated by how quickly and how fast it is growing, and what what impact it has had on my hometown of Lund for for all these years. So it's I'm blown away every time I see a presentation from from um, Medicon Village. So especially the the visionary picture that you show what the in what the area is going to look like in the future, hopefully, is uh, is really something. So uh, I don't have any questions, uh, but uh, those of you are in who are interested, uh, because as Peter mentioned, uh, you will have the chance to meet Medicon Village. And all of the uh, and hopefully a lot of the actors that are in the Medicon Village when we visit in, when you guys visit in September. So if you have any uh, questions right now, you should uh, you should get a, a taste of of what Medicon Village has to offer. Emma. Yeah, me again. Sorry. Um, so again, thank you very much, Peter. That was really engaging, um, and I I can. I'm not saying I could speak confidently about what you do, but I've definitely got a much better understanding. So thank you. Um, I just want to say, so Lorraine Lemon from our Dundee Science Centre has put a question in the chat. So she started off saying, very inspirational, Peter. Uh, can you elaborate on your relationship with Vattenhallen Science Centre, if there is any? Uh, Vattenhallen Science Centre. OK, yeah, actually, we don't have a formal collaboration with Vattenhallen. Um, it's it's actually very close to us. It's uh, super important in the sense that especially children uh, gets inspirations from there and uh, also get to learn about you know science in general and and hopefully become great scientists later on. I've brought my kids there several times. Uh, I love it. Uh, but it's it's part of the university. So I mean, for us, my board consists of board members from the university, the municipality, the foundation, obviously that owns us but also uh, the region. And we always try to, you know, find those areas where we can can uh, stimulate more science. And working with kids is super important. And we have actually discussed how we could increase our, I don't know how to put it, CSR profile by actually working more with the schools in Lund, for instance, to get them involved early. Um, 
but uh, so far I've, I haven't been here uh, that long. Maybe I, it's just uh, an uh, excuse that doesn't uh, is not okay. But I, I think I haven't been able to develop that yet. I've spent a lot of time actually forming my team, so we can be a 2.0 science park that I call it. Not only providing great facilities and providing you know a meeting place, etc., but actually start working more hands-on with developing new concepts on how we can help our, our uh, companies with the challenges they face, like internationalization, raising capital, uh, running big uh, uh, research consortiums, et cetera, and, and also get some attention from Stockholm. So Stockholm is also investing more in this part of Sweden because we need that and, and uh, build strong bonds to the Danish side. So uh, there's a lot more to do, that's for sure. And Vattenhallen is definitely one of these very uh, inspirational and nice, nice places that we we should work with. Uh, let me put it that way. Okay, so hopefully that that um, answers your question, Lorraine. Uh, so Jamie from Conglomerate Games, and um, he's come in and said that was fantastic. And um, can I ask if you know of many companies that make use of video games alongside their health tech? I, I have actually met uh, and had a discussion with uh, with some of the researchers here discussing the fact that we have so strong gaming industry in Malmö, our, our neighbor city. I live in Malmö myself, so I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, yeah. And uh, we have discussed a lot about it and I haven't seen any collaboration yet, but I know that one of the cancer researchers that is heading our biggest research center here at the site uh, discussed that with me and, and uh, said that we should do something about it. I also know that there are some app related uh, with working with gamification, I guess it's called, uh, where you try to make people, you know, stay and not and, and actually increase the, the chance that they will continue to use their apps and not get bored after just uh, using it for a week or two. So um, I will look into that until September, I promise, and see if there is uh, any particular companies that has taken a step forward. Uh, there is one co company called Pain Drainer, I think, that measures uh, pain, chronic pain, and they use uh, self-assessments and apps for for uh, working on how to to yeah um, ease the pain for for these people. And and that is they talk a lot about gamification as one uh, example of a company here at the site in Lund. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's really useful. Jamie, hopefully that's answered that. Um, but what I would say is, Olaf, it's maybe worth asking um, Game Habitat, who were on yesterday as well, might be worthwhile asking them the same question because they're obviously coming at it from, from the other side. Mm. Um, so it would be good to get an all-round view of it. And, and to sure. be honest, I mean, I, 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 I've met and had a discussion with Game uh, Habitat, but uh, since I've been 12 years in, in Copenhagen and just arrived back to Sweden, I still have to, to do some networking myself to really um, get in touch with all the organizations that could re be really helpful to, to increase uh, our impact. Mm -hmm. but, but to finish up from, from my side, I, I would say you can look at us. Uh, the Science Park here is the physical place and it's uh, quite accessible from, from uh, Copenhagen Airport. It takes an hour or so maximum. And uh, I mean, see it as a stepping stone into the Nordic market. You can easily dive in here and then uh, from here you can get to Stockholm or Gothenburg or whatever you like, and you can meet a lot of potential customers here as well. So so uh, yeah, it could be a good starting point and we will welcome you whenever you're arriving. Absolutely. And and Petra, you make a couple of really important points. So so you know you've probably covered it off better than I did, but that but that is the main purpose of, of the in-person visit as well. Because actually I know myself, you know, online meetings are great and it's great to be able to do that with all over the world, but but I find that I do my best work when I'm in person face to face. Um, and, and also sometimes it provides other opportunities that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of or come up with. Um, on an, an on a virtual meeting, and um, so yeah, really, really good. But thank you. Anyway, sorry, I've taken up enough of your time. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Petra. We actually have a couple of more minutes. Uh, if if there is any more questions for for Petter. I'm not entirely sure if uh, Ulla from Mobile Heights have joined us just yet. Um, I know he had a meeting just before this slot, so we still have some time. Um, I could I could uh, continue on on the question from from Jamie in regards to the gamification or serious serious games. 
uh, for uh, for medical applications. And there are a couple of games, for instance, we mentioned POW applications yesterday. Uh, that is a game or an app for, it is technically a med, uh, med tech solution or e-health solution where you play a game and help kids with uh, with eating disorders, for instance. But there is also uh, there is also another cluster uh, or organization quite close to Medicon Village that is uh, that is run by uh, an organization called One Reality, which works a lot with VR and AR in terms of education in uh, uh, ed education for for life science and and med tech as well. They've done uh, they have done a tour of the lung, for instance, so you can see the lung from the inside with a VR headset, uh, which is quite an, a, a cool uh, application. But also, as Petter mentioned, uh, retention in terms of um, uh, physical therapy or medical therapy is also big, uh, big areas uh, that people are exploring in terms of games. And we would love to see more of that type of cross collaboration here in the region, since we are quite, again, dense, as Peter mentioned, uh, with researchers and, and technological uh, know how. Uh, so, yeah, I hope that answers uh, even more informative answer. Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, no, uh, Ula is not here. I don't know if uh, I guess we can give Ula a couple of more minutes and see if he shows up. I hope he does. I, he hasn't reached out to me at least and said he has gotten any, in any trouble. Um, perhaps. I don't know how we, how you want to deal with this. Emma. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's OK. That's all right. So um, what I would probably say is I'll take this opportunity to just talk a bit more um, briefly about the in-person mission in September for anybody who doesn't know about it. And then that saves me doing it at the end, so it saves a bit of time. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, we are going to Sweden. We're going to uh, Lunda, at Skuna even. <laughs> we're staying in Lunda. Um, so we're going to Skuna on the 20, we're flying out on the 20th of September and we're looking to be there for two days, so 21st, 22nd. Olaf and some of his companions that have been doing these um, talks are hosting us. So we're going over, we're looking to visit as many companies as possible within the, the two day time slot that we have. Um, we've got a, a programme of events of people that will be visiting, people that will be coming to visit us. And also um, Olaf is doing a lot of work around getting as many other companies to come in and speak um, to us about how we can trade in, in Sweden, how Sweden can trade in uh, Scotland um, and how we can basically share, share those connections and, and collaborate. Because actually, you know, Sweden is, you know, fast world leading in a lot of areas as is Scotland in different areas. And um, so it's about kind of having those connections and making sure that we're building those really, really meaningful relationships. So um, as I've said, if you want any more information, if you can email either myself, so Emma Miller at dundeeandanguschamber.co.uk or international at dundeeandanguschamber.co.uk, I will put those in the chat um, and I can give you, we can give you a bit more information on that between myself and Ingela. Um, myself, Ingela and Alison, our CEO, who was on at the beginning but had to, to drop off, unfortunately. Um, the three of us will be attending, so we will be there to, to help with any questions and things that you have. Does anybody have any questions on that or anything they're not sure about just before we move on? No. OK. Does anybody have anything they want to cover off about the yeah. about the um, talks that we've had so far? Well, oh, you're making me work hard today, people. Come on yeah. now, <laughs> Terry, go for it. Hi. There is so much, so much to take in from all the different speakers, and everybody's done so well. So thank you very much to everyone and those still to come. That. It's almost difficult to understand how it's all going to be squeezed into to the visit when the group go across to speed and, and perhaps that's still unfolding how, how to pull it all together. But just to make sure for, for those who are attending 
that they get to have the touch points with the, the other participants where the collaborations could actually come to to, to, to bear fruits, you know, for, for each party. So I'm interested to understand, and maybe today won't be the day to understand that fully, but just making sure that those connections, and ideally I would agree with yourself, Emma, meeting in person is completely more valuable than the, the two-dimensional, you know, do, do not, doing it over this. So that, that would be my question. Yeah, sure. So um, it's a very good question, actually, Terry. So what I would say is that we're looking to do some in-person visits to some of the um, companies, but there will also be time for business to business one to ones. So, for example, if you're in a specific sector and maybe going to, you know, Medicon Village, just because we've heard from Petter today, so maybe going there wouldn't wouldn't suit wouldn't be suitable for your business. So, what we will look to do is we will look to kind of split that out. So, you would go and visit the companies that are relevant to you, or you would get in front yeah. of the companies that are relevant to you. Um, and I think that's really important, you know. And and probably people will have seen there's been people dropping on and off. Of, of these webinars over the last couple of days because there have been some that maybe they thought, oh, well, that's not relevant to me, so I'll come on at that point. So so the visit will very much follow the same format. We There will be an opportunity to speak to everybody if that's what, what you want to do, but also, like I say, especially when it comes to the business-to-business -business matches, that's about getting you guys in front of the, the relevant people to you and actually that's something that we we will be asking for so for anybody who does sign up we want you to tell us as much information as you can about who you're looking to speak to if there's any specific companies or as um, Olaf said earlier sometimes it's easier to go with sectors give us that information because the more information you can give us the better a match we can make and um, so yeah that really important points. I think it, it's valuable to contribute as well that even although food, food manufacturing, health and so on, and even technology in part is of great interest to me. It's still been very insightful to see the broader spectrum in, in the area because it, quite frankly, it feels quite different from my current location. So to see how things are evolving and how people are thinking differently and working differently, even although it's not a direct impact you know, on my my sector, as it were, but having that wider vision or int introduction to that is actually very healthy. So I, I I've stayed for for the duration of of both of them, and I and I feel, you know, that collectively there's some magic happening there as well. Good. Well, that's really that's that's really good feedback. Thank you for that. I can see that Ola has joined us now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Ola. Nice to nice to have you here. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll leave over to you. Ola, this floor is yours without further ado. So please take it away. So yes, thank you, Olaf, uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to uh, European colleagues and uh, and not the least Scottish colleagues, uh, which I understand uh, <laughs> is the audience today. Uh, my name is Ola Svedin. And I am uh, head of the tech cluster in uh, in our region in Skåne. It's called Mobile Heights. And uh, I will explain a little bit on the background. Uh, but first, I will try to zoom in a little bit on, on innovation. I mean, starting with, uh, with a little bit, where is Sweden today and where is our region in this? Um, uh, so uh, the idea here, is to uh, to uh, uh, look at innovation. I mean, uh, Sweden as a nation, we usually uh, clock in at. Uh, uh, let's see, I have a problem here. Uh, should should I share my screen? Perhaps is that uh, I, I. Olaf. Yeah, I think, yeah? I think yes, that, that would be, be very helpful. Thank yeah. You. yeah, so I will do that now. Sorry about that. That's better, perhaps. Can you yes. see my screen now? OK. Yes. Good. So looking at Sweden as, as, as a country, we usually clock in, uh, in in the top 10 when it comes to innovation, uh, different innovation scoreboards. Uh, the one I copied here is from uh, Bloomberg. Uh, 
To the right, there is the, the EU Commission, uh, the ranking of uh, EU countries when it comes to innovation. And, and Sweden has actually come out on top of that uh, the last couple of years. Uh, so, so as a nation, when it comes to, to innovation, at least according to these indexes, we are do, doing something right. Uh, and then looking at, at, uh, at our region, at, at uh, Skåne, which is, uh, as you can see, it's a tiny region uh, in, in Europe as a whole, with 1.4 million uh, inhabitants. Uh, and and uh, the EU Commission, they also do, make a, um, they, they also do a ranking of uh, all the different regions in, in Europe. Uh, and Skåne, I think this year, uh, or, or I know that this year, we ended up on, on the place number nine in, in, in a total of roughly 300 regions in, uh, in, in uh, the EU, uh, which is not so shabby. So we as a region, we are considered as, as strong uh, innovation, uh, as a strong innovation region. Uh, and when it comes to my area where that I'm working within, uh, which is tech or ICT or whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, what what are the dynamics here in, in, in Skåne? Uh, well, uh, we have uh, 40 years of, of uh, heritage from, from uh, commercial development of ICT products, uh, arguably longer than that. Uh, but it all it, it all uh, kicked off in the 80s, in the early 80s, in fact, with uh, uh, with leveraging the uh, strong university, technical university that we have in in Lund, the university city of of, of Skåne, uh, and and uh, and and building, uh, starting a tech cluster or an ICT cluster around the knowledge that uh, that uh, that was you know, provided by by uh, by the university. Uh, so we have we have a, a, a pretty uh, extensive uh, body of of uh, of engineering talent here in 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 the region uh, that comes from uh, a couple of company clusters uh, within the tech area. Uh, and and those big companies, they have in their turn, they have generated a hotbed for for startups. Uh, that is that is quite dynamic. In fact, it's uh, there's a lot of things happening when it comes to to uh, tech, uh, the the tech startup arena. We are only second to 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 Stockholm, the uh, the, the capital area, uh, and and we have some advantages compared to the capital area as well. And, and I'm sure that Olaf and his colleague ha colleagues have already uh, talked a little bit about this, why, why we are competitive when it comes to uh, uh, when, when it comes to starting new businesses and being uh, being uh, in, in an innovative environment. Uh, uh, so we, we have, I, I, uh, I, I was about to say the usual support for uh, for startups, for ICT startups in particular in Skåne, uh, with some, I would say, um, uh, edge uh, in, in some areas. Uh, we have a very active uh, investment fund uh, that is run by or, or funded by the university for R&D uh, seed companies. Uh, they have been around for 10 years and they, they uh, are in fact not only successful in, you know, uh, spinning out companies from the university, but they are also commercially successful. So, so uh, the uh, value of the portfolio of the companies that they have has increased uh, dramatically in value uh, since they started. Uh, we have uh, uh, a couple of different uh, incubators. With, uh, with focus on ICT, basically one in each of the largest cities in, in, in our relatively small region. Uh, we have free government sponsored business coaching. Uh, uh, we have a thriving tech community. I think uh, that everybody wants want to say that they have that, but, but I think that uh, uh, the pay it forward mentality and the willing to share knowledge that we see here is is something different. At least it's different from from what I have seen in 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 other places I've been, and I know that many many agree on that. Uh, and last but not least, we have active cluster organizations in uh, in our region. 
of uh, which we are one. Mobile Heights is the tech cluster organization. Um, and just very quickly to reiterate, what is a cluster then? Uh, uh, so this is the theory. This is the, the economic theory with uh, the uh, uh, around clusters. It's a geographic concentration of related industries and associated institutions. And it's important to remember, it's not only companies, but also all the support function and functions that the company needs to, to, to thrive uh, within a specific field. In our case, it's tech. And what is then a cluster organization? What does an organization like Mobile Heights do in the innovation ecosystem? Uh, well, one definition is this, also uh, fetched from, from, uh, from research. Uh, a legal entity that acts as an intermediary uh, or mediator between stakeholders within and beyond the cluster. Uh, a cluster organization should work actively with supporting cluster initiatives through tailored services that stimulate innovation. Uh, so, of course, you hear that a lot, open innovation, uh, we should we should cooperate. We should learn from each other, etc. Uh, and and we are we are trying to put the, the, those words into practice. That is what that is the daily job that we do as a cluster organization. Uh, and and lo and behold, there is also uh, research backing up uh, <laughs> the notion that clusters make a difference. Uh, so these are some metrics from the EU report, European Observatory, uh, Observatory for Clusters, that uh, that was published in uh, in 2019. Uh, some quite interesting metrics. If you look at what is called organized clusters, which is a, a cluster where we have organizations like Mobile Heights helping to organize the activities, uh, you can see that uh, uh, 77 percent of companies uh, have uh, ha more companies have high growth. Uh, another metric, 141 percent, more than double the number of rapid growth startups in in uh, in in organized cluster regions. Uh, and the list goes on. Uh, so it's quite clear uh, that there is something to gain from helping out in the innovation ecosystem and trying to organize it. Uh, in Skåne, just to give you a view of this, uh, and again, I'm not sure how much uh, Olof and, and uh, his colleagues have talked about this already. Uh, but if you look at clusters in, in, in Sweden uh, or in Skåne in particular, uh, we have organized it around smart specialization. Uh, and the smart specialization areas for Skåne you see listed on the right. Uh, so we have uh, advanced materials manufacturing. We have food innovation, we have life science and health, smart sustainable cities, tech, which is where we are obviously. Uh, and we also have the, the big research facilities, ESS and Max4 Lab, uh, defined as, as a smart specialization area. And, and around all those clusters, we have specialized organizations uh, catering to uh, these smart specialization areas. You see those lift, listed on, on, on the right on the map, on the Skåne map. Uh, so, uh, more in detail, what Mobile Heights, what we do then, we are a non-profit ICT cluster organization uh, promoting innovation and growth in the digital world. Uh, we have been around for uh, 13 years. Uh, we were founded by, by, uh, uh, by the logos you see at the bottom there, Ericsson, Sony, I think you perhaps can recognize those companies. Uh, Telia is the largest uh, phone operator in Sweden, uh, and also the two universities of Lund and Malmö, and uh, the regional government, not the least, uh, Region Skåne. Uh, as a non-profit cluster organization, we hold what is called the ECIA Gold Label, which is a quality certification for our kind of, of business. Uh, what, it, what it means is that, that we uh, uh, we have an independent reviewer or, or auditor uh, saying that, that we comply to the highest standards when it comes to a cluster organization. And uh, of course, we're, we're happy to be in that, in that uh, family, so to speak. Uh, and it also makes it easier for us as an organization to, uh, to uh, um, create new partnerships in Europe 
and also to lead uh, large projects. Uh, a cluster organization uh, uh, is by definition uh, catering to the different parts in, in, uh, of, of our society. So it says a business academy and society, meaning public uh, entities as well. Um, so our members is, 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 uh, is composed of, uh, of organizations and, and companies from, uh, from these different parts of, uh, uh, of the society. Uh, our community, we have uh, more than 120 uh, member organizations and companies uh, representing uh, more than 95,000 employees uh, here in, in, in Skåne. Uh, and this is what, what I call the logo soup, uh, just to give you a brief idea of, of uh, those 120 members. Uh, you can perhaps see, uh, you can recognize a few logos in here. Uh, most of them are probably uh, uh, unfamiliar to you. Uh, about 70% of our members are small or medium sized companies. Uh, but we also have some big uh, companies, uh, uh, you know, driving and setting the agenda for the whole tech cluster uh, as members here. Uh, when it comes to, to what we are good at in, uh, within tech in, uh, in Skåne, uh, a few words about that. Um, 5G uh, and 6G uh, and radio communication in general, we are very strong in that area. Uh, we had world leading research in, uh, at, at the Lund University. Uh, they were uh, trailblazers when it comes to uh, one particular technology that is called Massive MIMO, for instance, that is now uh, being put to use in the 5G standard. Um, uh, uh, Ericsson has had a footprint here since the early 80s, uh, 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 with uh, starting out with in fact PC development and later on mobile phone development. Uh, and nowadays it's one of the major sites for developing uh, 5G infrastructure systems. Uh, you might also be interested to learn that, that Bluetooth uh, which is a technology that all of us use every day, uh, was in fact invented here uh, by, by a team from Ericsson. Uh, so, so when it comes to radio communication technologies, we are, we are super strong, I would say. Uh, one of the few places on, on, uh, on Earth with this kind of, with this body of knowledge. Uh, the fact that we have had a, a quite substantial mobile phone industry here, uh, which is smaller today, uh, uh, but the competence is still here, the expertise is here, uh, also means that we are really good when it comes to uh, IoT, uh, embedded systems, you can call it, and also sensor technologies. Uh, uh, and why is that? Again, the, the, uh, the uh, a mobile phone contains all of these technologies. So when, when a lot of the mobile phone uh, momentum moved to California and Asia, uh, we kept the engineers here and they are now in different uh, other industries as well as in, in, uh, in startups. Uh, we are also very strong when it comes to image processing and, and biometrics. Uh, the second largest security camera company, Axis Communications, uh, have their uh, uh, R&D site here with some 1500 engineers uh, developing uh, cameras. Uh, all of that requires, uh, those products require uh, a lot of, of, of knowledge, obviously, within image processing as well. They are really strong when it comes to that. Uh, we were pioneers when it comes to uh, biometrics technology. Uh, I dabbled a little bit myself in, in, a, in a startup for, for a couple of years uh, when it comes to fingerprint technology. Uh, and those, uh, that company and, and the sister company became uh, world leaders in, in, uh, within the area of fingerprint technology. Uh, we have some really good examples of, of advanced AI companies coming from the area as well. Uh, uh, a lot of that uh, also connected to our strong heritage from mobile and, and security camera technologies. Cybersecurity, we, uh, we have some world leading research here uh, led by, by RISE, the Swedish uh, uh, Research Institute, 
uh, as well as a number of, of, of uh, really strong uh, companies within the area, primarily focused on, on, on uh, the application of cybersecurity within, uh, within IoT. Uh, so, Mobile Heights, what, what do we do as an organization if we zoom out a little bit again? Uh, so we are a neutral actor in tech and digi digitalization. That is, we are, again, non-profit. Uh, our mission is to help the companies here in, in our region to, to thrive, to grow and to become more productive. Uh, but we also uh, 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 channel that knowledge and that expertise into, uh, into public, uh, the public sector. Uh, where we, uh, of course, we have an ongoing process of digitalization that we uh, that we all want to to accelerate further. Uh, Sweden as a country, I think uh, we again we are quite high on the index when it comes to uh, digitalization. Uh, usually within the top three in in uh, in Europe, uh, but there is still a lot a lot to be done when it comes to digitalization outside the tech industry. And that is also an area where we are active in, in channeling expertise from the tech industry to other industries. Uh, more specifically, what do we do as an organization? Well, uh, we provide expertise. Uh, we engage our members in different uh, technology networks, open innovation projects, an open innovation project that is a project where uh, you work together with other companies, uh, with uh, with the academia, uh, with uh, with uh, research institutes, etc., uh, to create a new product, perhaps, but more importantly, to uh, to uh, uh, create new connections, new business connections, uh, and to share knowledge. Uh, we are also active within the skills and competence, so we help our members to find talent, for instance. We help our members to uh, find ways to, uh, to train uh, the, their employees. Uh, we, support, uh, we support our companies with, uh, with uh, financing options, uh, large and small. Uh, we help them to uh, to uh, reach out on, on markets. We have specific activities to uh, help startups. Uh, we also have specific activities to help them reach other markets, which is kind of uh, uh, the topic for today's webinar, I guess. Uh, and we also have a thriving community where we uh, where people get to meet each other uh, at at events. We have a lot of different events that we organize, uh, and we also help them with uh, with matchmaking. Uh, uh, every day, the everyday life as a mobile heights employee is means uh, helping people connect to each other. Uh, I will not dive further into the details here uh, with, with, with this. But uh, just to uh, conclude perhaps a little bit on what we are doing right now, what is in the spotlight right now for Mobile Heights as an organization. Uh, so we are working with on the technology side with, uh, with Internet of Things. Uh, there is one ongoing project that is quite interesting that is called Lund Open Censoring City. It's about uh, the application of IoT technology in, uh, in a city environment. That is on regional level. Uh, we also work on an interregional level, that is with neighboring regions in a digital innovation hub project called DigitHub. Uh, that is one of the, the, the vehicles we use to channel expertise from the tech community to other industries. Uh, also within technology, 5G is a test is is a hot topic right now. Uh, so uh, we are currently in the process of setting up a test lab for 5G, uh, and we do that with our Danish friends on on the other side of uh, of, of the sound. Uh, uh, we are also quite active right now when it comes to semiconductors. Uh, maybe you have heard of the. Uh, uh, the Chips Act, uh, the the EU chip, uh, the EU Chips Act, 
uh, it's becoming a hot topic with the uh, semiconductor shortage in all industries uh, as as a result of uh, of uh, partly of the pandemic at least uh, and also a realization that uh, Europeans must be a little bit more in control of our fate when it comes to semiconductors we cannot uh, we cannot only rely on 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 China and other uh, regions in the world for this we have to be more independent so that is an area where we as a, as a regional organization but also on, on national and european level that we engage uh, that's that's it for me and i guess that leaves like five minutes for questions is that right olof yes something like that thank yes. you so much ola uh, again uh, much like what i said about uh, peter hartman and medicon village as i'm born and grown up in in lund i've been with mobile heights or at least studying mobile heights from afar for a really long time and it's always fascinating to to hear uh, about what you guys are doing. So thank you so much for joining and presenting. Uh, and as Ola said, there is an opportunity for questions if anyone has them. Uh, it has been another two long hours with a lot of information. So I understand if, uh, if you're all overwhelmed with what, what is going on. Uh, but if there is any questions, I'm sure Ola will be happy to answer them. It appears that there is no questions, but you, uh, we will share your presentation with uh, with uh, all of the participants in, in for both days, and it, this is also recorded. So, and uh, you had your email there on the screen. So, if they have questions or want to get in touch, I think uh, that is another way to do it. Yes, feel. Feel free to contact me and uh, and and also even even if it's not uh, within uh, the tech sector or within the uh, within the healthcare uh, that I understand you had already today, uh, Petter and myself we can help out in guiding you also in the further in the innovation system here in 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 mm -hmm. Scotland. Uh, and of course that is your role as well, Olaf. But but again, do not uh, do not uh, hesitate to, to to reach out. And we will help you in the in the best way we can, and of course uh, hope to see you in real life uh, sometime soon as well. That's always more fun. Yes, thank you so much, Ulla. And I'll hand over to Emma for some final words for this this marathon of a two day event. And uh, yeah, thank you so much all for listening and uh, your patience with uh, with us and with me. And hopefully, as Ola said, we'll meet each other soon in person, hopefully in September, most of you or some of you at least. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf. So, so I, I just wanted to say thank you so much to you guys for, for coming on. I know for some of you, you have taken four hours, four hours out of your very busy business lives um, to join us. But I'm hoping that everybody's at least got a couple of nuggets to take away. Um, and obviously, you know, any follow up, please do come through ourselves here at the Chamber. Um, and we're more than happy to do those connections. And, and I'm not going to mention the in person again. Um, but we all know that's a thing. Um, so, yeah, so thank you very much, guys, and um, really appreciate your time and good to see you. And hopefully I can get round most of you for a coffee over the next wee while, because uh, uh, there's certainly some faces that I've not seen in a while, um, but would be really good to reconnect with you. So take care. If anybody's got anything, please do just get in touch, OK? Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.